Thank you all so much for joining us today. The program will begin in just a few moments. So hang in there and we will be with you soon. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm uh, Merv Lapus. I'm the Vice President of Outreach and National Partnerships here with Common Sense Media. Uh, I welcome you all to this week's Conversations with Common Sense. This is our weekly series where we talk about the timely, pressing issues that we're all facing during these challenging times. As part of this ongoing series, we've previously addressed tech in support of Black lives and parenting in support of Black lives. Today, we're here to talk about teaching in support of Black lives where education is now at a, at a crossroads. Since my team and I work directly with schools and educators every day, we are hearing a lot of questions focused on wanting to address structural racism, anti-racism, inequity, and so much more in their classrooms, uh, and especially with back to school. However, most really have little or no idea of where to start. Uh, so there are some great resources to read and explore. Uh, we share many of them even uh, for parents and educators on the Common Sense site, but putting them into practice is just a whole other thing. Uh, so I'm excited to jump into this conversation today with our guests and hope that they can help us navigate some of these complex discussions. So with that said, I want to introduce uh, Titi Layo Tenubu Ali, he is the Director of Research and Policy for the Southern Education Foundation. Uh, this uh, org organization was formed in 1867 in the wake of the Civil War to unite Northerners and Southerners in creating a system of quality public education in the South. She previously served as senior researcher and policy analyst at the Learning Policy Institute and co-led the Institute's equitable resource and access team. Titilayo currently manages the development of uh, SEF's research and policy positions and her background as an attorney informs her work on racial equity, civil rights, and equal educational opportunity. Welcome Titilayo. Uh, we will also be hearing today from Nairi Clark. She is a curriculum program specialist in technology for pre excuse me, pre-K through grade six for the Colton Joint Unified School District in California, Southern California, that is. Uh, Nairi has also been a reading specialist as well as a gifted and talented education certified teacher. She is a member of the African American Parent Advisory Committee or AAPAC for the Colton Joint Unified School District. She is also co-founder of Equity in Action California, an organization of educators researching and implementing ways to diversify technology conferences and professional learning settings. Welcome, Nairi. Uh, and then lastly, we have uh, Pedro Noguera is the Dean of uh, the Rosier School of Education at the University of Southern California, as well as a sociologist. Pedro's research focuses on the ways in which schools are influenced by social and economic conditions, as well as by demographic trends in local, regional, and global contexts. In addition, he is the author of several books on race and education. Uh, Pedro was also a professor at UCLA, New York University, Howard Un Harvard University, and the University of California, Berkeley, where he also was elected to the school board, during which time he also taught in the Oakland Public Schools. Welcome, Pedro. We've got such a great uh, group of folks uh, here today, but before we jump in, just a bit about today's program. Uh, we're, we're gonna chat for about 30 minutes or so, and then we're gonna take questions via the chat. So please have your questions or save your questions until you see the prompt uh, about 30 minutes in. You'll see a mark there. Uh, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, but as we get started, you know, want to put this back into context. As we head back to school, 
whether that means online or in person, it is impossible to ignore the drastic changes that we've witnessed in our country over the past few months. Uh, teachers must acknowledge and discuss that these images and the information that kids have seen throughout the past few months uh, are, are you know, playing a toll on their lives and pressure on their lives, but also from the pr police brutality and other racist violence acts that the black community to the global pandemic has also shed light on in regards to this digital divide and other injustices. These issues have a profound impact on our kids' health, their well-being, and their sense of self. So with that, kind of starting things off, big question, how can educators actually speak openly with our students about these types of injustice, especially racial injustice in our schools? Um, who would like to go first? Nairi, you're, right, you're in schools. I, Maybe you can talk directly I, first. I'd be happy to go first. You know, this summer, uh, we actually had, when the social injustices started, we actually had students reaching out to our school district asking for ways that they could talk to someone and share how they were feeling and what they were going through. So in our district, we were able to create a black student event, which uh, allowed the students, the parents to have a forum to come in and let us know how they were feeling. We guided questions that were developmentally appropriate from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. And we had our APAC, our African American Parent Advisory Committee, working with our student service division, um, create questions that were normed for all, all the grade levels. So they had the, the same questions just at their different developmental level. And we offered that, um, that session two times two times in the day. So we had a morning session and an afternoon session. And it was it was amazing. The students were able to get in there, let us know how they felt. We made sure to create a safe environment for them, safe for their parents, and, and let them know that they could say whatever they needed to say. And it was not just our Black students that were there. We had lots of students. We had students that came in that said, I see this happening to my friends. How can I help my friends? So having a form and having a place for those uh, for the students to share their thoughts so that districts will be aware of how their how their students are feeling and be able to plan from there and I'll have to be very honest with you there were there was a time when even teachers were sharing how they felt so African American teachers were even sharing their thoughts and their feelings about what they were experiencing as well as being able to address that with the students it was very powerful very powerful Wow. Titi Laya, do you think you can talk a little bit about how some of this is impacting your school communities where you have this this focus in schools in the South across many states? Um, how is this affecting them and what are some of the things that uh, you all have been hearing from your administrators? Yeah, Mark. So to your question of you know how to address this in this particular moment, I think that we can't really talk about the current moment and how to move forward without really all grounding and centering ourselves in how we got here in the first place, right? So you mentioned um, in the introduction that the Southern Education Foundation, uh, we were founded right after the Civil War ended. Civil War ended in 1865. SEF was founded in 1867 to unite Northerners and Southerners around the idea of developing a high quality public education system in the South. And we had to do that <laughs> because uh, you would be maimed, you would be killed, you would be imprisoned if you, as a enslaved person at the time, tried to educate yourself, tried to read or write, or if you tried to teach someone to read or write. So education was systematically um, out of reach for formerly enslaved people. And then for, uh, and even afterwards, we had to be proactive about creating a new system and a new structure to, uh, to correct that. And so that's why we were founded. And I think that there are some really natural entry points into this conversation as a teacher, as an administrator, and as a parent, if we just ground ourselves in the history of our country and how we got here, why we're here, being honest and truthful about the role of formerly enslaved people in the building and foundation of this country and how every single system we have uh, was structured around that. And so if we want to be intentional about uh, liberation and freedom and access and opportunity for everyone, then we have to have a level of intention in fixing it. We know from research that children develop a sense of race as early as six months old. 
And this is regardless of what their parents or teachers or anyone tells them. I have twin boys who are four years old and children are these little meaning making machines, right? They're constantly scanning their environment for clues about what's normal and what's the rule in this place. And if you can imagine, you know, you're little and you're sitting on the carpet in your morning meeting in the circle and you, your eyes look up and you're looking at, you know, I don't know, all of the presidents of the United States up until President Barack Obama. What does that tell you about what it means to be able to lead a country? When you look around your neighborhood, when you look at the resources in your school, you're making meaning of all of these things. So we have to first acknowledge that race is uh, an early construct. And what children do is they take information and they say, well, this is normal and this is the rule. Absent intention and conversations and actually working to dismantle those ideas, those little kids become adolescents, they become adults, they become policymakers. And we have to lean into these conversations and acknowledge that, you know, just like it was intentionally uh, created to be oppressive, we can be really intentional about making our democracy real. Sure. So now you mentioned creating the space and having the space for those conversations. Titi Lai, you're, you're mentioning um, being intentional and, and tying in the history of how we got here in order to address what's happening here. Um, Pedro, is there anything in your work from the from your lit the, the the literature you've written to the different schools that you've um, you know supported uh, in your time and now over at USC? Are you hearing anything or seeing anything that could help other educators uh, from K twelve and even beyond uh, to 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 more openly talk about these types of discussions? Well, I, I think um, the first thing to keep in mind is that it, this is a co constant issue. It's not um, something that just happened this summer. Um, you know, I'm here in L.A. We had a police shooting a few days ago, um, shot a man in the back uh, several times um, when he was riding a bicycle. Um, just listening to another program in Miami of a, a mentally ill man who was uh, choked to death by the police a few days ago. So these are constant issues and the toll it takes on children who are who learn about and are exposed, but also the adults, as, as we just learned, the teachers, everyone, the parents, everyone is affected um, by this climate. Um, at the same time, I think it's important that we not frame this only in terms of uh, the hardships this creates. Um, and that's because black people in America have endured uh, suffering and oppression uh, throughout our whole time in this country. Nonetheless, we have survived, we have thrived, we have contributed in all kinds of fields. Um, and, and that is a testimony to our strength and our resilience. And so I think it's very important for the listeners out there to not simply think in terms of the hardships, which are real and profound and have a take a toll on mental health, but to reinforce the sense of resilience in our children. Uh, our children have to know that despite the hardships, despite the, uh, the, the racism and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, threats that we're exposed to, that we have a history of, of rising beyond that, that allows us to continue to build, to support ourselves, and to do great things. And so you really have to strike a balance here. Otherwise, we run the risk of reinforcing a sense of, uh, of, of victimhood um, that is not helpful. Um, our, our people need to know that even in the face of great oppression, when you think of, for example, the Tulsa race massacre um, that occurred in 1924, um, you go to Tulsa today, you still see a thriving black community. So um, that is a part of the, the narrative that also needs to be reinforced. I, I love that, Pedro, and I think you're exactly right. And it brings up my next question, but I, I believe what you're saying there is so important because it is even in our in the literature that we read or what we're taught, we're often taught how we got past something or how black people got past these oppressive times or got got through things. Not necessarily. It wasn't just that, you know, individuals refused to move from their seat or it wasn't that, um, you know, they you know, we got past a hard time. It was that they fought through it. And it, it, it was that determination, that connection, that unity. Um, that is a part of the black experience, not just the issues that we tend to talk most about and then just say, well, they got through it to this point, so we're good. And it's like, well, no, there's actually much more as a, you know, not me, I, obviously I, I'm, I'm, well, not obvious, but I'm not a um, black or African-American individual, but 
um, recognizing that my community that I live within and that my friends and family, that it, are there much more than just what's happened to them, that they've done a lot to really kind of push past these things. And we need to hold those things just as high for our young kids, like Titi Lyo mentioned, are paying close attention to what this means for them through their development. So as we think about that, then what are things that we could actually, I say disrupts in the most like positive way um, from, from the, the way we teach to the policies and the way we teach? Because um, I imagine that there are certain policies in place that might actually be leading to this experience that are um, making uh, black kids um, and kids of color feeling uh, less accessible or that policies are against them. What are certain things we as educators should be thinking about? Well, I'll start with, for us, many of the teachers are looking at what does it mean to be a culturally responsive teacher? How are we connecting students' prior knowledge, bringing, allowing them to bring in their culture and connecting it to content so that they're learning on a deeper level? So everyone has to start someplace. And within our district, we are actually starting with a book study for administrators and our leaders at the very top level of what culturally responsive looks like. And then bringing that, that knowledge and professional development down to the um, CPSs, the TOAs, that will be able to help and support those teachers to start making that shift and see that it's not something extra that they're doing, but it's actually a mindset. And it's something that all students deserve. All students deserve to have their cultures acknowledged and valued and celebrated so that we are seeing Black excellence. We're seeing what is the best of that the students have to offer. And that's one of the that's one of the uh, first steps that we're taking to start making that shift. And again, like Pedro said, it's it's nothing that is going to going to just happen and, and be gone one and done. It's something that's ongoing that is going to be a shift that will will be the way that Colton is teaching forever at, at this point. Uh, so, so you mentioned ad from the administration down, uh, what are what are ways that administrators could instill this importance of creating a school culture or a curriculum um, or around racial equity and justice um, from again, from, from the topics themselves to even just access uh, what can administrators be doing to think about these things? Uh, Pedro or Titilayo? Titilayo, you go ahead. I'll go next. Yeah, um, and and sort of tying into what we just talked about, um, because I wanted to throw this in. Um, I think it's important also for us to, as Pedro was saying, um, shift the narrative. Because even sometimes when we are attempting to um, round out the narrative, um, we still center oppression in that conversation. So for example, I think that, you know, mathematics and science should not be taught without Katherine Johnson in it. Katherine Johnson, if anyone's seen the movie Hidden Figures, she was the phenomenal, brilliant mathematician who was behind many of the orbital calculations that were responsible for our first planes, right? Into space. We just need to embed black excellence <laughs> into everything we do because it's there and it's the foundation of our culture. Um, so to your earlier point though, of how, um, or to your later point of how administrators in particular can um, move the needle, I think there's really two things here. One is just like making a decision and having a sense of awareness about that. And while it seems simple, it's an important step. Um, actually at the Southern Education Foundation, we run something called the Racial Equity Leadership Network, which is uh, cohorts of school and district leaders um, and other executive leaders of districts who come together and say, we want to create a racial equity plan and really look at our curriculum, look at how we're doing professional development, look at uh, data, which I'll talk about in a second, and really be intentional about um, addressing inequities. So the decision is the first thing. We also, as leaders and, and those who are leaders in schools, can really take a careful and thoughtful look at data. So um, we have the benefit of data that can give us some insights on how students are doing um, and disaggregate that data in ways that can, uh, meaning break down the data so we can see how students of different demographic backgrounds are faring. So I think the first step is to one, collect the data, but then when you collect it, you have to look at it from an equity perspective, right? 
So for example, we have the civil rights data collection, which is every two years, federal government collects data and tracks all kinds of things. But one of the things is discipline. And we know from research and from even a recent study that Department of Ed did two years ago that black students, black boys, and students with disabilities are disproportionately um, disciplined for the same offenses, right? So you could look at that and you could either take a deficit perspective or you could look at it systemically. You could say, well, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> like they need to get it together. Maybe it's something going on at home, right? You can take a deficit perspective or you can really pull back and say, what is it about this data? Am I looking at what's happening in particular schools, in particular classrooms, um, even looking across the district and say, why might that be? And you might come to realize that things like implicit bias are in play, which is what the federal study from two years ago found that the only thing that could really explain it in those cases was internalized implicit bias, which is not you know, overt racism, it's subconscious stereotypes and beliefs about certain people going back to what I said earlier about how children develop what are norms and values and those children turn into adults. Well, we have some of those adults who are just operating out of what they've always learned um, and making decisions about uh, the goodness and the badness and uh, inherent uh, worth of certain kids over others. So I think that you know, making a decision that implicit bias and being anti-racist is something that your school, your district and community is really up for is the first thing. And then looking at the data, viewing it from an equity perspective and really saying we have the power to move the needle on some of these things. Could we have we could we have a training for all of our teachers, have them go through implicit bias training? Could we have different kinds of discipline so students aren't losing instructional time? Uh, which we know cascades into then dropping out of school, which then can cascade into the juvenile justice system. So I think there has to be a level of clarity and a willingness, but then also looking at the data and making decisions informed by that. So let me uh, jump in with a different, uh, slightly different approach that builds on um, both what Nairi and, and Titi Lai just shared. What I do when I, when I meet educators who are stumped in how to approach educating black children is I tell them about schools that serve black children well and what they do. And these are real schools that they can visit. So I'll, I'll share a story. I was invited to visit uh, Bear Bryant High School in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And, uh, and those of you who know football know that um, uh, Tuscaloosa is home to University of Alabama, great football team. Bear Bryant was the storied coach and the school's named after him. Now, like most college towns, you would think they would have good schools, but they don't have good schools. These are hyper-segregated schools. Mm -hmm. So it's an all black school with a mostly white staff. And I can tell just from talking to them that they don't believe in anything I'm sharing because they've never seen black children who excel. So I asked them directly, I said, have you ever been to a school where black children are achieving, where they're thriving? And no one raised their hand. I said, well, I bet you, you don't think it could be done, do you? And several said, you're right. We don't think it could be done because we've been trying for a long time and nothing works. I said, well, I want to invite you to visit a school with me in, in Brooklyn, New York, um, that where black kids are excelling. And to their credit, they sent seven teachers. And I took them to visit Medgar Evers High School in, in Brooklyn, New York. And they were blown away. They were blown away by black kids who excel in school, who take all the advanced placement courses, who are involved in theater, in math, in, in sports, and who could talk very clearly about their education and what it had done for them and where they were going. And many of them had now been admitted to top colleges and universities. And those teachers were blown away because what they realized, and this is so important for shifting the narrative, is that the problem was not the children. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. The problem is not the children. If you locate the problem in the children, then you think, I need to do something to change these kids. That's what we're seeing in some of these charter schools who think the problem is we got to beat, beat the badness out of these kids. That's why they have this very punitive discipline. No, the problem is the conditions we've created in schools, which treat children in a dehumanizing manner, which alienate them from their culture which lead them to actually begin to reject learning 
So they actually become anti-intellectual because of their school experiences, because they've been treated in a, in, in, in a, in a manner which no white parent would want to see their child treated. So when you look at the schools where black kids are excelling, then you realize what we have to do is change the culture, change the conditions, change the relationships so that our kids understand the power of education and appreciate it. That's what we've got to do. That's, I, I, I think that is right on. That sounds great. But what are some things? So as we think about kids at learning at different ages, have different learning differences, right? How do we differ by age? how we can start addressing some of these things, whether it's changing the way that we educate them from changing the, the culture. What are some of those things we can do? Pedro, let's jump back your way. It looks like you had a gesture, like you had something to say. I, I have a, uh, my grandson is visiting, so I'm waving at him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're on the spot. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's a lot we can do. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I'm very skeptical of bias training uh, in schools. And, and the reason why is because I've never seen it work. Um, I've seen lots of districts that spend lots of money on bias training and nothing changes. And a big part of the reason why nothing changes is because it's not directly connected to how do I improve my relationships with my students? How do I um, actually teach reading and math to my students? If you don't connect bias training to teacher practice, if you don't show them very concretely how to incorporate culture into their lessons. Uh, it needs to be very tangible and very practice-based. Without that, nothing changes. So you've got to, I think the approach we take to working with teachers has to move away from the abstract to the concrete. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why I like to bring people into schools to see what it looks like when we're serving kids well. So T.C. Lyo, you gave an example of how, like, how you do that in math. Are there other things that some of the administrators and educators in um, that are part of the Southern Ed Foundation work that they're doing that helps to um, really show, um, Case, some of what uh, Pedro is talking about. Yeah, I mean, we absolutely have to move out of the performative into, you know, systemic <clears throat> changes, right? Um, performative gestures are, some might say, necessary, but not sufficient, right? Um, I think that, you know, we can use what we know about, you know, the science of learning as we apply it, obviously, de in developmentally appropriate ways to students at different ages, <clears throat> also to how adults, right, change behavior. And so, as Pedro was saying, we know that um, embedded, lived, project-based learning is uh, the best kind of learning <laughs> for students and for adults. And so, really, digging into actual policies and practices and decisions and and changing um, changing the narrative not just by saying you're changing the narrative and you know verbalizing the new narrative but embedding teachers and leaders in experiences where they can do that so I mentioned the network of leaders we have um, they meet together over the course of 18 months of their cohort they share ideas uh, when we were outside <laughs> they would do visits right? So you have to do these things. A lot of the research we do and that I've done, you know, has certainly the quantitative component, but a, the qualitative component, which is very valuable data, hearing stories, listening to people, really understanding um, what's happening and creating a system of support around that to impact it. It was so powerful what Pedro said, and it's so true. The children aren't the problem. It's the systems that are the problem. And what would it look like if we entered every conversation with that in mind. Um, and I think when you when you ask that question, when we ask better questions, it'll lead us to you know different solutions. And those can look different in every place, but you absolutely can't ignore policy, practice, professional development, curriculum, um, the ways in which assessments are used. You can't ignore any of those things uh, when you're trying to, to shift a system that was first, you know, designed to perpetuate a certain, a certain norm. Yeah, and with all of that now, especially right now in this pandemic where many schools aren't starting in person at all, and if anything, technology is supposed to play a role in, you know, from blended classrooms to fully online. Um, but we know that even in the own research showing around access to um, a reliable internet or even access to devices, uh, there's still millions of kids without access, and many of those kids um, are uh, kids of color, especially in black communities. So. 
what are things that we have to think about or what are things that we have to address just recognizing that there's even this um, equitable, accessible divide for learning alongside with these things. Nairi, what is, what is your experience? What are you all trying to do to, to address those issues? Well, you know what, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because after that event and being able to have students voice um, low bandwidth and connectivity, our district actually created hotspots. So we have we have um, drive-in Wi-Fi hotspots now at all the middle schools. Before it was only accessible at the high school. So now we have it at the middle schools and we also have it at one of our elementary schools where parents will be able to drive in, not have to deal with their data. They can um, have access there. We also have have increased the um, the amount of hotspots that um, are take home. Before we had it where it was just one per student, but now we have these hotspots that have uh, unlimited data access. So parents were um, were sharing their frustrations and just what they were going through and reaching out. And our district is at actively trying to find solutions. Not perfect for everybody, but it steps in the in a positive direction that will allow more access to people. And as we roll that out and see how that how that is um, helping and supporting people, then we'll be able to, we were looking at Wi-Fi buses, you know, so um, just leveling up, having that relationship and connection with your community so that there is that conversation and we are actively tapping into their needs and trying to make sure that we're able to support them the best that we can. Titalayo Pedro, is there anything that you all are doing or that you, you all would recommend for uh, administrators and leadership to think about in regards to this challenge for their students? We can go maybe, let's go Pedro first. I know you guys have been courteous to each other. Uh, Pedro, how about you? Well, you know, I, I work with, um, you know, with with school leaders and, and superintendents and all around the country. And, you know, next week I'll be uh, talking to a group of, um, educators in Richmond, California, um, about how to improve outcomes for, for black students. And so I, I, I wanted to say, I'm glad that more and more schools are recognizing, look, what we've been doing hasn't been working and we've got to shift. Um, and, and a big part of the shift again is, is, as I said earlier, shifting how we see the children, how we approach the work. Um, in my my remarks um, with with these folks in Richmond, you know, Richmond is is a, a community at one point had the highest murder rate in the country, um, mm -hmm. and and it's a it's in a community surrounded by refineries. So so many of the children have asthma, uh, and 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 because the environment is toxic. And what I try to remind uh, educators is that you don't teach children in a vacuum. You have to understand the community context. How what's happening in their lives outside of school affects their experience inside of school. And we we need that kind of broader vision because it's when we take a more holistic approach to kids, we understand the social, the emotional needs of children and how they impact their academic needs. Then we can begin to use education as a resource to support not only the children, but their families and the entire community. But that requires the educators to see themselves as part of that community, not as outsiders coming in as missionaries, but as really as allies who are working in solidarity with families to uplift the whole community through their work in education. So it's a, a whole shift in the way we approach the work. Now, again, this sounds uh, um, dramatic, but in, in many rural communities, that's exactly what we see, right? Because the people working in the schools are from the community. Yep. They went to that school themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to um, Ruth Simmons. Ruth Simmons is was uh, first black president at Ivy League College at Brown University. Ruth came from, not, I think it was the seventh ward in Houston, grew up poor, one of, I think, 11 kids, all of whom went to go to colleges and universities, some of the top colleges in the, in the country. Ruth describes going to segregated schools in Houston and having teachers who saw her, she and her brothers in the winter without clothing, give them coats. They did that because they, they saw that these kids had, they were bright, they had potential, but they were cold. They needed a coat in the winter. That, where does that come from? That comes from understanding the humanity of our children. When we see that humanity, 
then we respond differently to their needs. And it's not, you know, we, we, we focus on so often on the wrong things. So, oh, we need social workers. And look, we need those support system. But it starts by needing to really see who our children are and understand what their needs are. And once we take that approach, then we can be much more resourceful in how we respond. Uh, but examples of that exist all around us. Yeah, I love that. And I live in Richmond and my kids go to the Richmond School District that's out here. So uh, I am very excited to hear about that work happening. Um, did you like Yeah, the other thing, you know, we work on uh, the policy level, right? So we're working with state legislators to, you know, the, certainly the piecemeal activity is important, but we want to understand like how, how can we make things accessible to all students in a district? Because sometimes you have your your star teacher, you have your star school, right? Uh, but not all students are getting access to those resources. So that's why strategically we work on the policy level. Um, so that means, you know, advancing policies that help to expand broadband, especially in, in rural areas where access is an issue. Um, it means, you know, elevating and lifting up particular unique partnerships with, you know, schools that can help provide schools and even businesses that can provide certain materials. It means advocating for fair and better funding, which is, that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. And it really is the conversation uh, about how, you know, the resources have to be in place to do a lot of the things that we're talking about. So, you know, we work on a policy level um, and try to, you know, really shift the policies that were intentionally put in place um, that have resulted in a lot of the inequities that we see. Yeah. Well, so as we get those policies put in place, then it's really the, how do we use those as a foundation to then actually see great work happen? And some of that means looking at, um, you know, does it really take a uh, whole village or community to kind of raise a child? And, and with that, you know, what are ways that we bring our families and our communities into this kind of uh, support success? Uh, Nairi, what, what are some of the things that you want to do this year or that you have been doing that helps to really look at partnerships between families and communities to help our students succeed and help black students succeed, especially. Well, I think um, one of the big shifts in our district was when we formed APAC, so that African Parent Advisory Committee. And there's many APACs around, I'm in Southern California, so in uh, neighboring districts, they have APACs as well. and this is an opportunity for for parents to come aboard and talk to the administrators talk to the people at the district level and have workshops um, it's not all sit and get it is working with that community of parents and seeing um, what their needs are and helping to support them offering tech nights offering and offering fun times too um, we liked we like to have fun so we've had skate parties we've had we've had um, uh, cooking days so we've had events where we've had cooking and and brought all the all the families in together. It's really about building community, creating a safe place, giving them a voice and letting them know that their voice matters. It, you can be the only African American student in that whole school, but your voice matters and we want to we want to hear you, we value you and we support you. So um, I would I would really um, offer that type of uh, interaction for different districts that don't have that. Look around and see if there's there's communities or or parent groups that you can start where those parents can act, actually start to have a voice and let you know how they're what they're thinking and how they feel and all of the family. Bring all the family, not just the not just the uh, the people that are in the home, but the whole family. Bring them in so that we really start to build that sense of community. Great. Are there, are there other th things, uh, Pedro or Titalayo, in, in regards to how you how you hope to bring more communities and families together around these conversations? Let me just reinforce what Nari was saying. You know, <clears throat> all the research, and I'm sure Titalayo can reinforce this, um, shows that when parents are involved with their children, the kids do better academically. And I always say to any educators, all you have to do is look at your highest performing kids and ask how many of them don't have parental support. And they always do, right? Uh, and, and, but parent support doesn't necessarily mean they have to show up at school. Many parents are working too hard, they don't have time. So what we really need is to, to give parents tools, how do I support my children at home? Mm -hmm. Which right now, 
during the pandemic is critical because if kids who don't have support at home from their families are really struggling trying to do online learning. So parents need to be encouraged to read to their kids, to, to do activities with their kids, and not just the little kids, but the older kids. Because uh, often as kids enter adolescence, parents start to think, well, I don't need to be as involved, which is, I think, often a big mistake. But uh, I, I think that Nairi's point about getting the whole family involved, older brothers and sisters can support their siblings, grandparents, relatives can all be involved and need to be involved, especially when you have single families where you have one mom who is often struggling with raising several children. So we need that collective support and children need to constantly get the message that what I'm doing in school is important and, and we need to encourage it. And as she said, make it fun. Well, speaking of getting uh, everyone involved, we actually have a question um, from the group here. This is from Valerie Kincaid. Are there good examples of cultural embedded uh, into curriculum out there? Does Colton have a curricular guide they're building and working with? And so Nairi, I'll have you answer that first, but then also as you, uh, both uh, Pedro and Titaleo, think about the superintendents that you all work with from the South and just throughout your times also, uh, please you know think a little bit about specific curriculum or content that you go to that help to put this in action. But Nairi, let's go with some of the work you're doing. Oh, for sure. We do not have a curriculum guide, but what we do have are teachers that are actively collaborating and team teaching to find supplemental resources that um, they can pull to. So if you are teaching um, about Native Americans or you're teaching about World War, World War One or Two, bringing in all aspects of all the cultures and not just one perspective or not just amplifying one voice. So our teachers are just actively um, collaborating with each other to bring those resources in, sharing different resources. Um, I have a resource that I'm gonna share out as well later on um, at, um, after this event, I'll tweet it out, that has lots of different resources, primary resources that you can pull from. So as of right now, no curriculum, just teachers actively trying to amplify all the voices in those stories and telling representative history of the whole history, everybody's, uh, everybody's views and um, making sure that all voices are heard. Great. Tita Lyle? Yeah, um, I wouldn't, um, there isn't one curriculum that I would recommend. Um, and I would also just um, invite a slight shift in, uh, or a slight shift in thinking about this, right? Like, I think that we can certainly take a step toward, you know, curriculum that, you know, tells the story. And um, I think that that's important, but I, I, I don't think that what we want to do is just sort of, flip what we already have right now. I'm thinking about a third way where we can really integrate a more robust and truthful telling into the curriculum that we already have, right? So think about, I don't know what your grade is or what subjects you're thinking, but you know, ask yourself questions like, who's represented in this text? As I look at this unit, who are the experts? Whose voice is here? Whose voice isn't here, right? And this you can do without a formal curriculum, right? I think it's really important for us to remember that this isn't just about specifically when we're talking about you know teaching in support of black lives we can't move too quickly to the performative without going to the personal and saying you know how am i as an educator as an administrator as a parent as a community member and friend how am i doing my own work and how am i asking myself the questions i need to ask to make sure that the way i'm showing up in the spaces i'm in um is uh, moving the needle forward in the ways that I can. So there are certainly curricula out there, um, but I think another way to think about it is, you know, integrating um, this conversation into what you're already doing. Um, and that's also, by the way, like how students learn. <laughs> Instead of just thinking of it as a silo thing we do in February, like thinking this is what this is what life is, this is what knowledge is, and this is what excellence is. And seeing themselves in everything, I think, is a a preferred and more generative approach. For sure. Pedro, how about how about you? So I, I just in the chat put some resources. Um, Lee and Lowe Books has, I think, the most extensive collection of multicultural books uh, in the country. Uh, you can go on their site. Uh, the American Reading Company has a collection specifically aimed at black boys. 
um, and then there's facing history in ourselves um, and several others that, that can provide resources to teachers who want to make sure that their curriculum is culturally inclusive and, and um, relevant to the needs of their, of their children. So, but again, it starts with the teachers have to do the reading themselves. They have to be familiar um, so that they, they then in turn know how to teach it. Um, All right. So it looks like there might've been a connection error um, or maybe it's me. Well, you didn't hear me. No, uh, I, I'm back. Was it me that left? I'm, but I'm back. <laughs> we, we heard, we heard most of it uh, for sure. We, we did see the, uh, the collection from Lane Low Books. Uh, you also mentioned the American Reading uh, Company uh, and their collection for Black Boys Facing History, Ourselves, Rethinking Schools, all have great culturally relevant resources for folks to use. Did I capture that? That's good. All right, awesome. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I've heard a lot as well from educators. Like, if you're not sure how to start the conversation, where to, there's a lot of great media out there from books to movies, uh, to other, to art that are done through the voices and through the art of black people. And if there's one way you wanna really kind of bring those into your classrooms or even into your family discussions, you know, watch it through the perspective and have an opportunity to kind of discuss those things. If there was one thing you want people to walk away with today from this discussion, what's that one thing you want them to be able to walk away with from today? Uh, we'll start with uh, Nairi. The one thing that I, I would really encourage all educators is to take the time to really make, make relationships with your students. Like, get to know them on a personal level. Um, little Nairi, you should you should know that I lived with my grandmother and that my uncle's nine years older than me and that he helps me. Like that's something that would be important for an educator to know. So really take the time to get to know your students and build authentic relationships. Great. Uh, Pedro? Yeah, definitely. In, in addition to building uh, the authentic relationships, I, I really want to encourage uh, the, the, the educators out there to really get to know your children, get to know the students you teach. The test scores don't tell you anything about a child. They don't tell you about their interests, their motivations, about their families. Get to know them uh, as people. Um, at, because in many ways, our racial stereotypes and assumptions limit our ability to know each other. And so it is when we really know them, then we can begin to teach them. You can't teach someone you don't know um, because invariably in this country, uh, the, the narratives around race inform our interactions and that's what we have to disrupt. Thank you. Titi Layo. Yeah, I think the, you know, the one thing that's coming to me right now is that this isn't simple, but it's also not complicated, right? Like the, the way that we have come to be and the way that you know, um, schools have come to be, students have come to be, and even stereotypes and impressions can also be undone. And for me, that is that is uh, a hopeful thing. So I would say to teachers, you know, you can be, instead of being, uh, you know, a silent presence on these issues, you can be a contributor to how students are coming to see themselves in the world. And, you know, teaching in support of Black lives and I think this was said earlier, but I just want to reiterate it. This is for everyone, whether you have black lives in your classroom or not, right? We're moving towards, um, we want to move towards a different vision, right? Of what it means to all value all lives and really um, have voices be heard and, and, be, uh, and contribute to society. So I think that we can take sort of comfort in the fact that these are things we can do, right? We've shared some resources. We, I've shared some questions you can be thinking about in your practice. And once you uh, commit to it, uh, you can go, kind of go down some paths and seek the professional development and support to do that. Um, and if you, if your district is supportive of that, that's great, but there are other resources available. Um, if, if not, and certainly, uh, in our work, we help district leaders sort of embed racial equity into their way of being and doing in the district. And um, if any of you are leaders, we certainly welcome you to um, reach out to us on that. We can share resources about how to operate on a more systemic level and even a policy level to uh, make some of these changes. Well, thank you so much to you three for such a rich conversation um, and, you know, helping us to have the, the, the conversation um, confidently and openly. And I think sometimes that's the challenge for folks is like, how do I have this conversation? It just feels awkward. And really it's like, you know what? 
it's more important to have it regardless of how you're feeling. If you're not ready for it, or if you feel like, oh, I don't know how to get into it. Starting the conversation and being open to having it is a good place to start. But you all shared a number of great uh, like things to think about from policy to resources to, to research and even applying the classroom. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your thoughts. And just thank you for doing the work you do um, on the ground um, for educators, with educators, and for families and kids. Um, if, if you are all looking for other ways as we think about this time where we're at home and our kids are continuing to learn or you're continuing to learn um, as an educator or a parent um, and, and looking to support all kids, but from our black kids to brown kids to white kids and everyone, we know that this is a time where a lot of us are learning from home. I uh, just wanna make sure that you also know uh, that we've got a number of also free resources online and as well as activities you can take offline that are available both English and Spanish through our wideopenschool.org site. Um, so I want to make sure you guys knew that um, some of the resources that uh, we talk about here coming from um, the uh, uh, Facing History and some of these other resources, Teaching Tolerance, a lot of those are also highlighted right within the Wide Open School site. Um, wanted to also let you know that next week, uh, the Conversations with Common Sense will be off, but I encourage you to visit our Conversations with Common Sense YouTube channel. Check out some of our previous talks on race, mental health, parenting in a pandemic, and much more. Uh, visit the site right there and you can see all of our previous videos. You'll also see this recording pop up there when it is done. Um, lastly, we also invite you to join us on September 16th for a special event called Common Sense Together, Building a Better Tomorrow. We will have a provocative conversation about educational equity with some very, very special guests. And you can register for free at the link below. Should pop up soon for you to be able to use, um, but please uh, register there. And until then, uh, here is a look at what we have planned for that inspiring evening. Many schools around the world, as you know, have shut down. Some kids could be falling behind. We can't learn lessons someday because someone doesn't have Wi-Fi. Teachers haven't been trained to do this. Our students have never done this before. Families don't know what to do. Our children, anywhere they are, again, regardless of socioeconomic status, should be able to learn anything they want, anytime, anywhere. It is part of our, of our civil rights ethic that everyone ought to have access to high quality education. So again, the, that event is free. So please register and join in to that conversation. I just want to say again, thank you so much to Nairi, Titilayo, Pedro, um, and for all of you chiming in today. Such an important conversation. Uh, and I just appreciate your time, especially with back to school happening as we speak. So thank you again. Everyone have a great week um, or great rest of your week. And we will see you all again soon.